నమస్తే ఎవరి ఐ రాజేష్ టెక్లి స్టూడెంట్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియన్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ ఆఫ్ టెక్నాలజీ మద్రాస్ ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ వందే మాత్రం ఫ్యామిలీ ఎక్స్ట్రీమ్ గా హార్టీ వెల్కమ్ టు అవర్ చీఫ్ గెస్ట్ ప్రొఫెసర్ సుభాష్ కాగ్రి మెంబర్స్ ఆఫ్ ది ఫ్యాకల్టీ స్టూడెంట్స్ అండ్ ఆడియన్స్ టీమ్ వందే మాత్రం ఆఫర్స్ డీప్ గ్రాటిట్యూడ్ టు ఫ్రంట్ లైన్ వర్కర్స్ బ్యాట్లింగ్ ది కోవిడ్ నైన్టీన్ ప్యాండమిక్ వి విష్ దట్ ది వరల్డ్ రికవర్స్ ఫ్రమ్ దిస్ టాలెంట్ ది వందే మాత్రం ఫోరం అట్ ఐఐటి మద్రాస్ ఎస్పైర్స్ టు టేక్ ఇనిషియేటివ్స్ that introduce and sensitize the student community about India's rich cultural, economic, socio-political, scientific and technological heritage, its ramifications today and the thoughts about the roadmap ahead. The shlok from Ramayana, Janani Janma Bhomishcha, Pargadapi Dariyasi, which means that mother and motherland are superior to heaven, is the philosophy which has kept us going ahead in the last six years in this institute and strengthens our national consciousness vande mataram our national song embodies the historical cultural legacy of our nation our national song has inherent nature which facilitates every bharatiya to visualize and bow down in reverence to the divine maternal imagery mother india and inspires everyone to perform their national duty we have been proudly following the tradition of singing the national song vande mataram at the very beginning of every lecture therefore i request indira ji to take over and sing our national song vande mataram vande mataram sujalam sukala mangaya jashi kala Mataram, Vande Mataram, Shubra Jotsman, Ulakita Yamini, Kukusumita Dhumadala Shobhini, Suhasini, Sumadhura Bhashe, సుఖదాతరం థ్యాంక్ యూ సింధు రాజీ ఐ వుడ్ లైక్ టు ఫాలో అప్ అవర్ ఫ్యాకల్టీ అడ్వైజర్ ప్రొఫెసర్ రమాశంకర్ వర్మాజీ టు ఇంట్రడ్యూస్ అర్ చీఫ్ గెస్ట్ థ్యాంక్ యూ Dr. Kak for accepting our invitation to speak on behalf of Vande Matra. <coughs> we are glad that you are here uh, in the early morning uh, from Chicago. Uh, I would like to tell about something briefly about uh, Dr. Subhas Kak. Dr. Subhas Kak is an Indian-American computer scientist and a basic scholar who has made major contributions to cryptography, artificial neural network and is recognized as one of the pioneers of quantum computing. He is a resident professor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater. His research area includes cyber security, social network, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. He is also a recipient of the British Council Fellow, National Fellow of Indian Institute of Advanced Study and a distinguished alumni of IIT Delhi. He is currently a member of the Indian Prime Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory. Council, known as the PM Institute. Dr. Koss is also <coughs> author of the 20 books, including the architect, Architecture of Knowledge, The Nature of Digital Reality, Mind and Self, and Master and Mind. Matter and Mind, he was awarded in his fourth Halis Bay and Award at Musei last year. Last year, 2009. And I uh, welcome you uh, for this. So, National Science Day is celebrated in India on February 28th, every year. The day is celebrated to commemorate the discovery of the Raman effect by great Indian physicist Sir C.V. Raman on 28th February, 1928. Vande Madaram organizes National Science Day special lecture <coughs> to sensitize the youth towards scientific knowledge and development and to motivate them to pursue science as a career or profession. In the past, we have had the opportunity to host Professor K. Ramasubramanian 
for a lecture titled The Golden Age of Indian Mathematics and Dr. Y. S. Rajan for a lecture titled My Trist with Science and Technology in India. Today we are delighted to have Prof. Subhash Kalji to enlighten us and give a talk on the topic How Indian Ideas Have Changed. How Indian Ideas Have Shaped World Science. This talk will be followed by a brief question and answer session. So I request you all to raise the questions in the comment section on our YouTube live stream. Without taking much of time, now I invite Prof. Subhash Kalji to deliver the much awaited talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Varma. Thank you, Rajas Milinji. And thank you, Vande Mataram for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak about my view of how Indian science has played a fundamental role in world science as we know it. Uh, to begin with, uh, let me mention that about a thousand years ago, um, a historian of science and cultures writing in Islamic Spain, a person called Said. Andalusi, he wrote a book as, uh, as from his vantage point, his understanding of uh, the various scientific nations of the world. And in that, uh, even though he was so far up, uh, away from India, he concluded that the foremost nation in terms of scientific contri contributions was India. Now, the other nations that he talked about were, of course, uh, Arabia, Iran, Rome, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, and so on. But he concluded that India was the foremost nation. Now, what does that really mean? It means that the general understanding amongst the literate people or amongst the well-informed people, even a thousand years ago, was that... Um, most of the important ideas at that time um, where, uh, where had come from India. Now, what has happened uh, in Indian education in the last 60 or 80 or 100 years is that we are being provided a Western uh, view of India or Indian science from the perspective of the West and uh, for for um, considerations related to the empire and other considerations related to political control over India, uh, somehow the, uh, the, the idea that was communicated and is still being communicated was that India was not a nation of science and India was probably mainly a nation about uh, caste uh, conflict. Now, uh, we seem to have... Uh, internalized it and um, when um, various subjects are taught um, in uh, school books, uh, in the school curriculum or college curriculum, they do not give an insider's view of what uh, Indian scientific history is. So what I just want to do uh, in the uh, time that I have today, talk about just a few items. Uh, now, we are indeed told uh, in uh, the school curriculum that uh, the symbol zero played an important role uh, and uh, it uh, arose in India at some point in time, uh, maybe 1500 years ago. And then uh, it was adopted by Europe only seven, 800 years ago. And it took about a couple of hundred years for this to be accepted widely uh, in Europe. Uh, because uh, there was opposition from, from many quarters. They thought uh, uh, negative numbers were devilish and we shouldn't have it. So from a sociology perspective, what it tells us is that the simplest ideas can become quite difficult uh, to, to, to spread because uh, they might conflict with certain uh, elements of uh, the recipient uh, society's culture. And one of the uh, oppositions uh, was, uh, as I mentioned, to negative numbers. Uh, while, as we know, uh, Brahmagupta, in his wonderful uh, uh, description or statement of um, uh, zero and negative numbers, 
what he had done was to look at negative numbers as dead and positive numbers as well. And therefore, there was no uh, epistemological problem. But that was not the case in Europe. Now, it's normally um, credited to um, credited to the discovery or uh, the advances in the study of infinite series, uh, starting with Newton and Leibniz, that the beginning of the scientific age uh, is uh, is described in the West, and uh, it's uh, uh, generally believed that after that. Uh, because the infinite series were fundamental to the development of calculus, everything changed. It changed, and then uh, math could be used in a variety of fields, and that uh, set off the scientific revolution. And later on, in a couple of hundred years, of course, we had the industrial revolution, which is what has brought us to our modern age. Now, it's uh, much less. Uh, uh, known widely that uh, the whole framework of infinite series was uh, developed in India a couple of hundred years prior to Newton and Leibniz, and this is of course the uh, well known, well known now, uh, with, you know, Kerala School of Mathematics and Astronomy. And uh, there are uh, many scholars who are claiming that. The Kerala school was quite uh, active um, in uh, in Kerala and uh, rest of uh, southern India at a certain point when there were also Jesuits uh, from Europe. And uh, these Jesuits took this map to Europe and it took some time for it to sort of percolate down. And this is what uh, brought about the scientific revolution. So if this... Uh, this narrative is accepted and there are many uh, historians who believe that this is the right way to look at it. Uh, and what they say is that uh, they, uh, the libraries in Vatican where uh, there ought to be uh, evidence related to um, this, uh, uh, this transmission of uh, Indian um, knowledge of uh, infinite series and calculus if they were to be uh, thrown open to scholars, which they haven't been, then uh, we would uh, have uh, definitive proof. So, so this is, of course, very uh, important. As we know, um, this, uh, yeah, this made it possible to, uh, to, to develop, uh, uh, develop uh, um, analytical and other uh, techniques, let's say, uh, in uh, civil engineering or mechanical engineering and a lot of things that could not have been done before were now done or included within the ambit of mathematics. Now, uh, another thing which is where uh, the uh, knowledge uh, that we have uh, is much more recent is uh, the very foundations of uh, Indian uh, physical thinking. Now, as we know, um, in the Vedic system, the Vedas themselves uh, uh, speak about uh, the science of consciousness or Atma Vidya. But then you have the uh, Darshanas, you have six Darshanas, and one of them is the Vaisheshika. And Vaisheshika really is from the word Vishesha or special property of uh, physical objects. Uh, you have Samanya, which is universal, and Vishesha, which are special, which depend upon uh, where the observer is and how the observer uh, perceives uh, the physical object. Now, the six darshanas, uh, if Vaisheshika is, is about physics, then you have Nyaya, which is about logic. You have Mimansa, which is analysis of existing knowledge. Then you have Sankhya which is enumeration of various categories. And uh, you also have uh, uh, yoga, which is uh, where you bring in uh, a whole psychology related to observers. And finally, you have Vedanta. Now, a lot of uh, Indian scholars have been interested in Vedanta. And of course, um, Nyaya has been studied by uh, philosophers uh, 
um, both in India and uh, overseas. But Vaisheshika sadly has not been uh, studied by Indian um, physicists or uh, historians of science. Some philosophers have, but uh, their interest is very limited. Now, there's a very interesting uh, sidelight to Vaisheshika. Uh, that uh, when Vivekananda was in uh, New York in 1896, um, he uh, met um, Nikola Tesla, where uh, Vivekananda has one, uh, where the formal educational system in India, or informal, if you will, also included the, the six versions. So he was aware of the general frame, framework of fascism. So he told Nikola Tesla that it should be possible uh, uh, for you to, since you're very interested in wireless transmission of power, it should be possible for you to show that energy and mass are interrelated. Um, and uh, we have a record of that in a letter that Vivekananda writes soon after that meeting. And then we also have a record in uh, Nikola Tesla's own diary where he mentions that this is what uh, transpired in that meeting. Now, there are some people who suggest that since Tesla is a Serbian and Einstein's wife Mileva was a Serbian, and of course Mileva was an unknown, Nikola Tesla was a superstar of his times. So it's quite possible that this uh, idea of energy and mass transformation, uh, the, the, the importance of the problem may have been communicated. There is an American scholar. I personally don't believe there's any evidence in support of it. But we do know that uh, the, the authorship of the 1905 uh, paper of Einstein's, um, uh, where he talked about the special theory of relativity, originally, before uh, Einstein changed um, uh, the, auth the names of the authors, after he received the proofs, originally had both uh, Albert Einstein and Mileva Einstein as joint authors. And we also do know, well, this this is of course the story about how some people believe that uh, uh, that work should have been uh, jointly uh, credited. And we do know that when uh, Mileva and Albert uh, divorced, one of the conditions was that should Albert win the Nobel Prize, the money that he would get would be given to the labor. And I believe uh, when he did win the Nobel Prize, I think it was in 1921, he didn't quite uh, keep to the entire bargain. I think he gave only half of what he received to the labor, even though they had been divorced for many years. So now uh, I told this story just to make a point that uh, Vasheshika does speak of all these possibilities. Four or five years ago, I translated the Vasheshika and be very happy to share that book. Uh, it is available easily um, uh, on Amazon.in. Uh, and uh, it's an amazing book, Vasheshika, Vasheshika Sutras of Kannada. Uh, he has uh, the laws of motion and uh, two of them are almost identical to two of the three uh, Newton's laws of motion. Um, and uh, including one where he says to every action there is an equal uh, and opposite reaction. And, and many others and ideas of invariance and the idea that there are four uh, different kinds of atoms, two with mass and two without mass, which seems to be quite consistent with our current conception. Now, uh, we don't know to what extent Vaisheshika had an influence. But what is also of um, relevance to us in our uh, discussion or conversation today is that why isn't all of this a part of the discussions by historians of science in India? Why is India still so totally mesmerized by the colonial gaze that Indians only work on things which sort of were uh, written out by Western scholars uh, 80 or 100 years ago, 80 or 100 years ago, or which are only a part of uh, the Western Western preoccupation with history of ideas, where certainly 
you can't blame Western scholars where the West is uh, in the center and um, and most uh, or certainly my own personal experience is that most uh, good scholars are totally open-minded and if they don't talk about Kannada's Vaisheshik Sutras, that's because they don't know about it. It's up to Indian scholars to step up and write about these things and then they would be a part of uh, uh, of the world story of science. Now, uh, just to make the point that most um, uh, scientists are open-minded, you do know that uh, Schrodinger, one of the two creators of quantum mechanics, in his own autobiography, mentions that uh, the Upanishadic idea of I am Atma Brahma was the central uh, notion which gave him uh, the, the intuition that what was required in quantum mechanics was this idea of superposition. Superposition meaning where all kinds of possibilities exist in the quantum state, which is somewhat like in the moment of inspiration that he had, uh, was somewhat like the idea of uh, that the Atman, which is or the Pinda, which is the body, which is the individual, contains the entire cosmos. And the Atman, the Pinda, and the Brahman uh, have an equivalence, which is one of the central ideas of uh, quantum, uh, of, of the Upanishads of Vedanta. Now, um, historians of uh, quantum mechanics, in fact, you can read uh, Walter Moore's um, biography of Schrodinger, where he claims uh, that many or most historians uh, acknowledge that uh, quantum mechanics as formulated by Schrodinger and Heisenberg or von Neumann and their and subsequent uh, scholars uh, is perfectly in consistent, perfectly consistent with, uh, with Vedanta. And, and uh, one aspect of that is in Vedanta, you have uh, the physical reality and consciousness, Atman, and uh, the embodiment, two sides of the same reality. So the orthodox uh, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is what is embraced by most people, consciousness is the other side of physical reality, that you cannot uh, create a theory of consciousness uh, based on things, on, uh, on objects. Consciousness is not an object, which is, of course, what Munda Kognition, for example, says that there are two kinds of knowledge, apara and para. And apara are all the uh, are all the sciences or all the narratives related about reality where you can use language. Uh, so apara are all linguistic uh, narratives, and all science is a narrative. All science is storytelling of its own kind, where of course. You can also bring in hypotheses and tests and this and that, but that's also a part of the story. Um, while para is the is Atma Vidya. Para is which is not conducive to be described in language, which is why you also have para va. You cannot have you cannot describe para in terms of words. So para va is not ordinary language. You know, as we know in Bhattrahari spoke about these four aspects of language, uh, Vaikari, Madhyama, Pashyanti. Pashyanti, of course, is the conceptual uh, schema that you can uh, uh, talk about. But beyond that is uh, Parava, uh, which uh, is what connects you to the intuition or Pragna related to Para. So we see that this, of course, uh, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, um, is uh, the central uh, science of our times. Without quantum mechanics, you cannot have uh, chemistry. And of course, without quantum mechanics, you, can't, you don't have physics. Without it, you cannot have chemistry because you can't explain why the atom is stable, for example. And without chemistry, you cannot have biology. Without biology, you cannot uh, talk about brain science. And, and without brain science, you can't even conceive to even approach uh, what the shadows of uh, consciousness might be in terms of uh, subsidiary 
uh, processes in the brain because that's what neuroscientists do using fMRI, for example, functional magnetic resonance imaging. They can see if you're doing thinking of a certain kind or doing certain cognitive tasks, where is it that the brain lights up? Now, that doesn't really explain the mystery of consciousness, but at least it provides you certain correlations. So, uh, quantum mechanics is totally fundamental, and the fact that, uh, at least in the words of um, Schrodinger himself, it was the Upanishads which gave him the central idea, is a very significant element. Now, the other element that I want to talk about is uh, uh, formal uh, machine theory. Formal machine theory goes back to the development of mathematical logic in the 1850s. And you have names such as Augustus de Morgan, George Boole, and Charles Babbage, who lived in England, uh, London, around there, uh, associated with it. And you know about Boolean logic, for example, uh, De Morgan in terms of set theory, and Charles Babbage created a mechanical analytical engine. Uh, and so some people consider Babbage to be the father of the computer. So he had yeah. some program, etc. And computers of a certain kind were used uh, uh, mechanically for weaving and so on. They are still used in looms. Uh, now, of course, you have embedded uh, electronic or digital control. But uh, to that extent, uh, before the invention of the computer, say 60 or 70 years ago, there were these uh, uh, computing uh, machines uh, which were used, which were a part of, uh, um, of um, industrial practice. Now, uh, George Gould's own wife, Mary Gould, who was a writer uh, in her own right, mm -hmm. uh, wrote uh, an essay in the 1890s. Uh, George Gould died, I believe, in the 1860s or so. He died sort of young, and his uh, wife was a prominent uh, science writer. Then she wrote a uh, famous essay in the 1890s. And I've written uh, an article on all of this with all the references for uh, current science, which where you can look it up, where she says that, look, um, these people are being praised, these three, but um, their mentor was George Everest. And George Everest had been the Surveyor General of India for many, many years. And in fact, his grave is in Suri in the Pradesh. So he would come go to England from time to time. And these three were a part of his intellectual circle. And Mary Poole suggested that the central ideas that became a part of mathematical logic were explained by Everest, uh, having learned them in India from the pundits from whom he was learning Navya Nyaya. Now, Navya Nyaya is a development of Nyaya, which took place about a thousand years ago in Bihar and Bengal. Um, and uh, according to scholars, uh, modern Western and Indian scholars, uh, for example, uh, the names of Stahl and others uh, come to mind, uh, Navya Nyaya already is equivalent to mathematical logic. So we had it, and we do now have a uh, gen genetic connection uh, in terms of uh, the claim that uh, Mary Gould makes that, look, uh, it's not that uh, these three were ignorant of Nabiya, which is equivalent to mathematical problem. So you should give credit to a central Indian idea, uh, which has uh, changed the world because um, to the extent that mathematical logic is uh, essential for, say, logic gates, Without that, you cannot have integrated circuits and uh, all of the rest of the stuff that uh, emerges uh, from there. Now, um, there is a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. She's even claimed that David Hume, uh, a Scottish uh, philosopher, he um, learned of the approach of uh, skepticism, which is uh, fundamental to how you pose uh, hypotheses and uh, check them. 
she claims that uh, before he returned to Edinburgh, uh, he studied uh, in France where uh, there were these uh, Buddhist uh, monks uh, who, uh, there was a monastery or something, I don't remember the details right now, uh, and he's, she's written uh, uh, substantive articles on it. So there was that other connection as well, because now if you go back um, and uh, go to the um, ferment of ideas in the first millennium within India, uh, the Buddhist scholars, um, many of them like Dignag or, or uh, Vasubandhu and others, and then you had uh, those who were part of the uh, Kashmir Shaivism, which is of course another uh, another way of another formulation of Vedanta, uh, critiquing them and looking at questions in such modern scientific terms, in terms of what your hypothesis is, how do you use logic to analyze. For example, they were looking at questions such as, uh, how does one recall memory? And this was a big element uh, in the thought processes, thought processes in uh, different Buddhist schools, like Yogacara or Ravi Dharma and so on. And then Kashmir Shaivite uh, scholars such as uh, Utpal, uh, Utpal Deva or Abhinav Gupta, the great Abhinav Gupta, they argue that, look, you cannot, you cannot assume that everything is transitory. There is no connection. There's got to be um, a mind or there's got to be an entity which is able to bridge across different moments of time, which is what they call Shiva or which is what you might call consciousness. And therefore, consciousness has to transcend uh, material processes, which is, of course, Vedanta. So this is another formulation of Vedanta. So we, what, what we find is that India has had this amazing history of uh, continuing uh, discussions of uh, very, very subtle matters. And they have come up with resolutions which are still relevant. And they are still relevant also because... The, um, the future of science, having come up with uh, uh, a lot of uh, descriptive power related to physical reality, well, although I should probably uh, revise it, but be because um, it appears to be a lot of physical uh, power, but truly uh, there is a huge crisis in physics. Uh, physics uh, is cannot explain 96% of reality as posed by generally accepted theories uh, in physics. They have been compelled to postulate dark matter and dark energy to describe 96%. And another 3.5% is interstellar gases. And therefore, all that physics, when you come to cosmology, is based on is only point. 5% of reality. So there is a huge crisis. And, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, so we don't know where all this is going to go. But if we forget this for a moment, and we imagine that, um, that physics has been able to explain the outer reality very well, but the mystery of the inner reality is the final scientific frontier. And um, there are, of course, efforts. People are doing, uh, as I mentioned, uh, fMRI, uh, looking into the brain and uh, looking into the uh, meditators. And it's also a compelling problem from the perspective of computer science itself, because the question is, will computers become conscious? So where does consciousness arise? And if uh, it arises because of the complexity of interconnections, then uh, computers themselves should become conscious uh, at some future time, which of course has the most astonishing implications because if computers become conscious, they will get rid of all human beings or, you know, these pesky little creatures which uh, are never satisfied. And therefore, what is the future of reality? What does this universe mean? So all of those questions come to the fore and they are important also from the perspective of where is society go going? Will there be jobs for people if you have pervasive automation and AI? Because most jobs will be done by machines. 
And therefore, the question is, who am I? What is consciousness? Or how does consciousness um, affect physical reality, if at all? Because if you have physical laws, if there are physical laws, then we should not have any freedom whatsoever. Unless um, you accept, say, the orthodox Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, because then consciousness is always apart. But then still the question is, how does consciousness interact with the experiment? How does the observer interact with the experiment? And this is one of the central problems of QM, the so-called measurement problem. And uh, and um, my late friend, uh, the well-known Indian physicist, George Sudarshan in the 1970s, along with a collaborator, wrote a paper where he showed that just by observation, you can control a physical process. And this is called the quantum Zeno effect. And it's been uh, shown, uh, demonstrated in the lab. And, uh, you know, many um, prominent labs across the world at the best universities have shown that it's, it's indeed true. Not only can you freeze the evolution of a physical process, of a physical state of a quantum mechanical system, you can also steer it to whatever uh, direction that you want. Now, uh, was this, for example, anticipated uh, within Indian thought? Yes, this was anticipated a long time ago. And in Vedanta, it's called Drishti Srishti Vada. That through the question that uh, uh, these uh, scholars within the uh, Vedanta tradition and also in the Tantric tradition, in fact, in my view, this is much older because uh, the person associated with the formal statement of Rishti Srishti Vada, I forget his name, he was uh, in, this, in the south, in South India, maybe four or five centuries ago. But if you go back and look at the Tantric literature of, you know, 15, 2000 years ago or even earlier, um, uh, you find uh, this uh, as a central notion. And the idea there is um, that, uh, the, well, firstly, uh, the scholars were saying that how does divinity, how does Vishnu or Shiva or the goddess, how can they change uh, the physical system, physical reality? Because the Vedas also say that there is a rit or rhythm. There are laws behind everything, behind all physical processes. And the answer that they came up with was that through drishti, and there are these, there is rhythm. So the Vedas, the Indian tradition accepts it. There are laws. So how does divinity do anything? Through drishti. Through drishti alone is this drishti created. And in fact, uh, in the tantric tradition, here I defer uh, from uh, the, uh, the chronology that normally is associated with Tantra that, hey, it's 500 CE, it's only 1500 years ago. That, that's not correct at all, not credible at all. Because if you go back into the Upanishads itself, in the Shvetmashvata Upanishad, uh, uh, for example, you find that Shiva as an embodiment of consciousness is through uh, his... Uh, through his activity, a consciousness through his activity, which is, of course, what is Shiva's dance is all about, is uh, both creates and destroys the world. Uh, and, and this dance represents this continuing process. And even in, uh, uh, in uh, the more, uh, you know, the representations that you have of Kali, for example, um, in uh, Bengal, elsewhere, uh, in all uh, tantric traditions, all across the world, uh, all across India, you have, uh, uh, you have, or in Sri Vidya, Sri Vidya is very popular in the south as well, in Sri Vidya, which is a representation of both physical, the outer reality and the inner reality, you have uh, Prakriti through its various uh, uh, koshas or, or shells, at the very heart um, Within uh, this envelope of uh, Maha Saraswati, Maha Lakshmi, and uh, uh, Maha uh, Durga, uh, you have um, the Bindu, which is where Shiva resides. So what that really means is that you cannot 
represent or you cannot truly reach Shiva because Shiva is always para. Shiva is always para. And this is going to be the very heart of science of the future um, for um, both sociological and scientific reasons. Sociological um, reasons because, as I mentioned, jobs will go away. Um, uh, there is already, because of this, jobs going away or change, change in human consciousness, if you will, as a consequence. Uh, population in many countries, in Western countries, is falling, uh, including Japan. Uh, also, the population is falling because people sense that there are not going to be jobs. And more and more people, even in America, they're turning inwards. They want to find out answers to this. They're turning away from formal religion, maybe excepting for 10, 15 percent, let's say in America, 10 percent in Europe. They want to connect to uh, the, this discipline associated with yoga. Now, here, by yoga, we are just using a, um, a big placeholder, meaning related to the inner space. Uh, related to the nature of consciousness because yoga is just a doorway, so to speak, to this inner world for the Westerner. So all these the changes are uh, taking place and, uh, and so um, Indian science is not only of antiquarian or historical interest, although it's important from that perspective. And why? Because if you ask me, why has China done better than India, even in IT, even in computer technology in the last 20 years, when China was far behind India 25 or 30 years ago, is because most Indians and Indian elite are uh, still uh, under the uh, control of uh, those, those, that colonization, the Western colonial gaze, which said that Indian didn't have science. They have accepted it because they don't know their own history and they don't have confidence. So they just took the Fort St. George model, which is the East India Company model, where the Europeans or the English were running Fort St. George and the workers at the back in the dark rooms were Indians keeping the ledgers. So Indian leaders 25, 30 years ago said that we will do the ledgers for the rest of the world. India will be back office. And we Indians, our leaders, the business leaders and other elite didn't have the confidence to say we want to go ahead because their understanding of Indian history is false. What the Westerners did, what the British did, they planted this false history and we have accepted it. Our books are still school books, NCRT books. For example, I was looking at the ninth class uh, book on science and I looked up um, the chapter on atoms and it gives one line to Canada and it's totally wrong. So the guys who wrote this chapter don't know anything about Canada. Why? Why are only we copying second, third hand from sources which who themselves don't know about it? So what we have to do is to take charge of all of this, firstly change the curriculum. We have to have confidence. We have to produce products ourselves um, uh, like the Chinese have because they were, they use more of common sense. They said, well, if the uh, Americans and the Europeans are producing these things, we should be able to produce it. We should have our own uh, um, portals. We should have our own social media. We should have our own uh, products and they did it and now they are as good as any. We, we have been too afraid uh, to produce products because we are not in touch with our own history of science and technology. And until uh, we do it, so that aspect of Indian science, the story of Indian science is important maybe primarily for psychological factors for us to attain agency, for us to be able to do things as well as anybody. And what happens to a lot of Indians who come to America, they go through uh, soul searching and then they conclude that whatever they had been taught in Indian uh, curriculum in school and college was wrong. 
and we are as good as anybody. That's why Indians are the most powerful, most successful community in the U.S. They're the wealthiest, and you can check it out. They're the wealthiest. They're the most successful, most powerful uh, community in uh, in entrepreneurship, in science and technology, and in other fields as well. And as you know, three or four weeks ago, uh, President Biden was introducing one of the new vice presidents of NASA, and he says. And maybe he was saying it in joke. He says Indians are taking over the U.S., but why aren't we doing better in India? And for that, science is going to be a very important element of the story. Now, so this is the psychological and sociological element. The other element is that uh, the future of science is in um, the better understanding of consciousness. You know, how do we approach it? That's going to change everything. And my personal take, and I work on this as well. And some of you may have seen my articles on um, on uh, dimensionality of space, where I've argued that space is not three dimensional; it's slightly less than three dimensional, and which is how where gravitation comes from. And these articles were published very, very, very recently in Nature's Scientific Reports. So I think that this fundamental relook. Where, at least as far as I'm concerned, I my intuition because before you can do any science, you have to have an intuition. My intuition is informed by my understanding of Vaisheshika and Nyaya and Vedanta and so on. But we are not giving it to our own citizens in India. Now, in some families, uh, people have uh, are connected. They probably have tutors. But why are so? So that's a good thing. Uh, where they do learn it, and it em empowers them, and they're extremely successful all over the world. But why haven't we made it a part of the entire of the curriculum? Maybe just the course or whatever, so that young people, young boys and girls, are more confident. Which is what we want them to be confident to be leaders. Which is what we need uh, uh, in the world where I believe with. These ideas, because Indian ideas, um, as as a student of uh, not just Indian history but uh, also of say Chinese or European history, um, I can tell you that Indian ideas are the most comprehensive. You, you go back to the Vedas. There is this distinction not made in any other civilization. This distinction between upper and para, between the outer and the inner, and the whole. Um, um, uh, depth um, of understanding of the nature of mind, the uh, manchikoshas, uh, for example, and uh, the various practices, so that anybody uh, can do it. It's, it's uh, Indian science is universal. Every human being is equal. Every human being doesn't really matter what background, etc. Because the other thing that the British did was to handcuff Indians. Through this false notion of jati uh, varna uh, convergence, you know, every in my view, uh, having read the primary sources, uh, the every human being is all the four varnas in there because in every human being is the same purush. Every human being doesn't really matter what jati they come from, and jatis have gone up and down. So we should tell or uh, be able to communicate this that look. Every human being can do this based on what their temperament is and what they want to do, and uh, this is the most comprehensive approach to reality in any world culture and civilization. I'm talking of the entire Vedic river, and it's a approach to reality which where you accept all the outer sciences, which are the upper vidyas, accept everything upper. Upper is fine. But finally, for para, you must turn inwards. And you have all these amazing practices, which very, very few people know about. Very, very few people know about. Which uh, are transformative, which, uh, which completely provide one the capacity, uh, like the siddhis that uh, uh, Patanjali speaks about in uh, his uh, Yoga Sutras, give every human being the capacity to do the most amazing things, to give the capacity to every human being to become a genius. I see I've uh, done exactly 45 minutes. 
So I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions on, on all of this. Thank you, sir. It was indeed an insightful talk. The information you presented enlightened us on the topic. Now we shall have a brief question and answer session. Shayan Mudundar Ji will read the questions from the live chat on our YouTube channel. I think it was a very comprehensive presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Although the time is less, we if the time is less, we could you could explain more bit, a little bit more in detail. Yes. Right. But there are many videos. I've given presentations and I have many published papers. I don't know, 100, 200. They are out there. And you can look them up, you can look at the details, you look at the references. Sure, sure. And, and But if there are any specific issues that uh, any of the viewers had, I'll be happy to amplify on that. Sure, sir. Uh, over to you, Shandy. Hello, hello, Dr. So, uh, the question is <coughs> from one of our students. The question is. Vedic chanting is said to help develop one's mental power and strengthen memory and faculties. What are your thoughts on that? Like chanting mantras and like how can we tell younger generation to in getting introduced to this? Okay, my answer is that uh, there could be different practices based on the temperament of the individual. For some, Vedic chanting could be a wonderful thing. Uh, because of their connection to it and having experienced it uh, at some point um, in their uh, childhood. And of course, there are also, uh, there's also a study that people who do chanting, their memory, etc., is better. There is a, a scientific study related to that. But my answer would be that not everybody has to do that. People can do different kinds of sadhana. Somebody could do chanting, somebody could do dancing, right? Dancing is also a sadhana, or you could be a painter, or you could be doing this or that. So whatever works for one, uh, it's always good to have some guidance at that, and which is where you know the guru or the instructor or the mentor comes in, or it could be in one's own family, one's father or mother or an older brother or an uncle, whatever. So. Vedic chanting can be wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. It sounds so beautiful. It's uplifting. Uh, and that's it's one of those moments of uplifting that one can really get that central idea. Hey, this is what um, this is what it, it's all like. So it's a good thing, but maybe not for everybody. So, sir, this question is from my side only. So, this question, okay. question like you have, you are talking about the Chinese people and how they are building their everything, their, their app and everything, but. Uh, there are like one of my friends is studying in like, doing masters in UCL. You are also uh, sharing his thoughts with me. Like the Chinese students go there, uh, government funded go there. They always try to stick to their culture and they stick to their language and everything. And whereas, whereas our students they go there and they always try to copy or idolize American things, way of life, everything. So do you think it uh, like it have some effect on the final outcome of the brain drain or something from India? This is a problem because of the fact that uh, we and certainly our elite within India remain colonized in our minds. You know, the Indian mind is still colonized. We and, and have written on it and I feel very strongly about it. Why are we insisting even now that young people have to learn English before they can learn programming? Why, you know, the Chinese don't learn English to learn programming. Our children in uh, primary school or in uh, middle school uh, without knowing English, why do we have imposed these restrictions? You know, we are somehow uh, telling indirectly, if not directly, that there's something wrong with our culture and with our languages. They are inferior. So a lot of uh, Indians carry that baggage to the West as well. So we have to take pride and not take pride by looking down on others, but take pride in our uh, culture and our languages and in our history while being respectful of everybody else's. And until we do that, 
you know, there's no reason why. But I did uh, say, and it's a fact, that Indians are the most successful community in America, which is where we have a level playing field. But we would probably be even more successful if and, and be able to connect to everybody else also in a much more creative way if we had more uh, connection with our own culture. But a lot of people in the West, once they come here and once they have spent some time here, do want to get connected to their culture, which they were not back in India. So there's a kind of a change that occurs when you leave India. Because in India, the pressure uh, through the media, certainly the English media, on denigrating India's own culture is so strong. I just saw a headline yesterday uh, um, uh, ridiculing this project on the title was mythical Sanskr uh, mythical saraswati river this is in the hindu why mythical you know saraswati it's a part of history you have the rig veda you have the nadi sukta and so on saraswati is a reality so why do you say mythical just because somebody who wants who looks at it from a political angle because you want to put down people who are, want to be connected back to their culture. This is ridiculous. You know, this is called, this is self-hate. There's no need to do it. The English media doesn't have to fight India's history. Uh, let's just accept it or whatever, what, which is accepted universally by scholars from the West and from India. There's no debate about all the things that I mentioned to you. If we accept all of this, make it a part of our curriculum and then move on. And, uh, and so we are not constantly fighting India's history, which is sadly what the history, what, what the record is in the past 30, 40 years. The fight is getting sharper and sharper. The English media has to ridicule. And, and then sometimes people who talk about uh, India's past uh, don't make things easy by, uh, by looking at um, accounts within our own books in a literal way. Not everything has to be taken literally. Some of those things have to be taken metaphorically. You know, for example, if you say you flew, it doesn't mean that you actually flew in your body, right? So we have to use uh, that judgment. But I blame the westernized, politicized um, Indian journalists and writers more because they have more responsibility because they control... Um, uh, institutions of power and they have not exercised their responsibility uh, uh, ex exercise their power in a responsible fashion because we see it even now all the time whenever there's an indian festival ridiculing and there's no reason you have to move on in the west people uh, jur journalists or writers don't ridicule their own past and there couldn't be things that you could ridicule because this is supposed to be okay a, a separate sphere. This is not the general sphere we are talking about society at this moment. And and that step is yet to be taken uh, uh, by India. That's probably because the westernized elite think that they are responsible keepers of what uh, the British elite, the, the gays, through which the British elite saw, or the British colonialists saw India. So they want to carry that gaze onward. It's, it's, rather, it's rather pitiful. That's all I can say. Uh, sir, there is a question from Neeraj Kumar Singh. So he's asking, uh, why are the educational things we're talking about not becoming part of our mainstream education? Well, Two things. First of all, uh, I believe um, uh, there is a new education policy and many of these things are going to be changed. But forgetting the government, I don't see why on education leaders in universities, in IITs, the directors taking charge, you know, they always have to wait for Delhi to take these decisions. For example, I do believe that IIT Bombay, about 15, 20 years ago, there was a director and he said, we should also have a um, professor teaching uh, uh, history of Indian science. And that's how Professor um, Ram Subramanian, who you had on Vande Matram, he joined the faculty. So why can't the other directors do it? There's nothing 
revolutionary about it. This is nothing subversive. We are only talking about knowledge. And once you have uh, faculty uh, who know about history of Indian science, they will be able to offer courses which students will be able to take. So I think there is a kind of a paralysis, if you will. Nobody wants to take decision. And it's not that, that they're being held down. I think it's up to the directors and the senior professors uh, in the IITs and IISC, Bangalore, and in other universities to say that enough is enough. Let's take charge of our own destiny. Let's take charge of our own education. And we don't want to teach something which doesn't make sense. We just want to teach whatever is impeccable, whatever is um, from a scholarly point of view, absolutely right. And if we do it, we are only doing what we ought to be doing, which is to provide education. Uh, question from Dr. Rameshwar Pure. How scientific knowledge transfer happened in India over centuries? Well, the sociology of it, well, we, they were partialas. I think Professor Dharampal has written a book called The Beautiful Tree where he's shown that contrary to, once again, our self-understanding of education, perhaps India's literacy was 60 to 70 percent, or maybe even 100 percent in certain places, because in these temples, these temples were also part shalas. They had part shalas. And kids of all communities, he has data, where he has used data uh, written up by British superintendents of education who came to India in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So education was quite universal. And once the British decided to shut it down, by the time they left, India's literacy had plummeted to 12% in 1947. So there were partials, there were schools, there were academies. And of course, India had the world's first universities, not just Nalanda and Takshashila, or even in Kashmir, we had Sharda P, a great, great university. Um, I was, uh, you know, you'd be shocked that when the 1947, 1948 war was going on between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, India stopped and Pakistani troops were on the defensive and they were being pushed back. India stopped six kilometers south of Sharda Peak, uh, which is on the Kishan Ganga River. We were on the mountain ridge. But our leaders, including Prime Minister Nehru and others, probably had no idea that this is where the Great Sharda Peak was. So now it's six kilometers on the other side of the line of actual control. Because we have been disconnected from our history and whatever history we have been told, not in all details, of course, I'm uh, uh, exaggerating, but a lot of what we are being told, certainly the central ideas uh, related to our history are wrong false history that's been imposed on us and we have not um, thrown it off and I will not blame Delhi all the time. I will not blame the various um, uh, capitals of our uh, states. I think it's up to our own um, leaders of the IITs and the universities because this is, this is knowledge which everybody accepts. Why don't we take the initiative of changing it as IIT uh, Bombay did and they introduced history of Indian science and I believe IIT Gandhinagar has also done that. Why can't the other IITs do it? Why is everybody waiting for the education ministry in Delhi? People have to exercise agency and do the changes um, that uh, need to be changed now and not wait for five years and ten years. So here's a question from Sairaj Bhattaji. So he asked you, he does you, temples, ashrama, those that had institutes, those are the institutes of knowledge, for say, Naya system logic. We don't see now. Without incentive, people don't see diving into some field. How do you go about it now? Oh, you, you're talking about Nyaya. Nyaya means logic. You're talking about Nyaya and not Nyaya, right? Yeah, like the people used to go to the temples and ask them to seek knowledge. Okay, okay, good question. Good question. Very, very good question. Right. This is okay. something I thought about even here in the US. America has some of beautiful, beautiful temples, you know, hundreds, wonderful temples. What I'm telling them is now the time has come 
to also introduce uh, uh, learning because um, these uh, colleges and universities are only teaching you upper knowledge, which is useful. Everybody should go through upper knowledge, which uh, provides us discipline of thinking and learning skills and so on and getting connected to a certain history. But for para knowledge, for darshanas, etc., I think you, uh, in Hindu temples in America as well, um, need to get connected to how temples were run. Because right now, it, we have a horrible situation. Look at Tamil Nadu or look at most of uh, India. Tamil Nadu, about 37,000 temples are being run by the government. Why is the government doing it? Government doesn't have the skills to run temples. Why are we doing, we meaning the government's doing things that they're not supposed to be doing? So we are taking agency away from ourselves. We have to give agency back and tell them that, look, you should also do certain such other things. Because unlike Western religious places, which we are more about being connected to what law, perhaps, what, what a certain prophet did, and you just want to remind yourself about that. Indian temples are about knowledge. Veda means knowledge. They, and of course, there could be some side of it, which is practice. But ultimately, knowledge is communicated to so many different ways. And you had the various arts. You had, um, you know, various colors, which were a part of what was taught in the temples. I think temples need to go back into that. And that's uh, again, where temple leaders will have to take the leadership and say that, look, we want to do these things also. And how do we, what kind of systems do we need to create so that this would be done? And sometimes one, one despairs and sometimes one thinks that perhaps these things will be done first in the West by the temples. And then very sadly, it's only then that the Indian temple leadership will wake up and also introduce these elements related to knowledge because there is one element related to pilgrimage, right? Fine. And that satisfied certain elements of what we want to do in our lives or in our temples should be providing that as well. And now the other thing is that a bricks and bricks and mortar university as we know it could be failing all across the world because it's too expensive. In America, it costs more than $50,000 a year. And what do you learn? What you learn there, you could also learn through freely, through MOOCs, through free courses. So is it really worth it? And if the universities start failing, then the whole question of how education should be imparted to the next generation will once again come center stage. And possibly uh, good leadership at temples might provide certain new ways of doing it and perhaps Technology could be an element, like the conversation that we are having right now, which is how also uh, knowledge can be communicated. Thank you. So, this is the final question from Mr. Chandra. So, he is asking how we can say that Aryan invasion happened or not? Do you have any insight about this? Well, uh, uh, there is no evidence. All the Vedic literature is about uh, India, you know, they are. What, what was called Aryavarta or Sapta Sindhu, and the later Vedic literature, for example, Aitreya and uh, Dhamana, uh, Aitreya, Aryanika, etc., that speaks about regions which are beyond, beyond the Himalayas. For example, Uttar Kuru, which is Central Asia, or Bhalik, which is again towards the west, Uttar Kuru, Uttar Madhra, and so on. There is no region outside of India. And um, I've written a lot on it, and uh, we don't have time right now. But um, short answer, there's no Aryan invasion. It's all a made-up thing, uh, and uh, there's no evidence that supports it. Uh, even the latest DNA evidence uh, doesn't support it. And then uh, you also have the spread of um, Vedic or Indian ideas, not just across the Himalayas, also to China, to missionaries. Uh, Kumarajiv, for example, they're still chanting Kumarajiv's uh, Lotus Sutra. Or towards the West as well, and I've recently written uh, stuff on that, the Slavs, they worshipped, uh, their chief divini divinity was called Shvetavit. You may not have heard of it. Shvetavit, which means the knowledge of light, 
uh, the knower of life with four heads, uh, you know, just like Dhamma and so on. All of these things are coming out now and being written up in scholarly journals. And uh, but the Aryan invasion theory played a very significant role in dividing up. Certainly, Tamil Nadu it's still a very alive thing. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, a lot of people are very passionate about it. They feel that indeed such an invasion took place and we must right that wrong. But, you know, all kinds of wrong history can create passions and it's one of those things. Thank you, sir, for answering our questions. Your answer really answered a diverse set of questions. I express the sincerest gratitude to Professor Subhash Kalji for this wonderful talk. We are grateful to you for coming to our platform and connecting with us live. I would like to thank our viewers for joining us live and supporting us, our IIT Madras faculty, students, administration, our Vande Mataram volunteers, and our faculty advisor, Professor Ramashankar Verma sir. At last, I would like to thank our alumni of IIT Madras family for unconditional love and support that you have been giving us for the last six years. Now I request Sindhuraji to conclude this session with the National Anthem. Janakarna mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharata bhagya vipata Punjaba sindhu gujarata maratha dravida uttala banga Vindhya himachala yamuna ganga Uchala jaladhita ranga Tava shubha name jake Tava shubha aashisha maage Kahe tava jaya gata Gana gana mangala dayaka jaya hai Bharat bhagya vibhata Jaya hai Jaya hai Jaya hai Jaya 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 hai Thank you, Professor Kok. Very nice. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, audience. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. We hope to see you all at our next event very soon. Sure. Those of you who are interested to volunteer and receive updates regarding further events, please email us at vandamatra at the registry.iitn.ac.org. Thank you all.